Before we begin this Torah 101 podcast, I have a brief message for you. I'm sitting here in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, and it is December. It's December, which means it's the last month of the calendar year 2023. And I want to reach out and make a brief and gentle appeal for your support in 2023 to support the great work of Torch. As you know, we have one fundraiser a year. And we already did our fundraiser in the early parts of 2023, but always try to get one donation from everyone a year. If everyone gives one donation every calendar year, we will have the strength to continue, have the support to continue. So if you have yet to support the Great Work of Torch in 2023, please consider making a donation, visiting our website, torchweb.org. You can find the link in the description. Give us some support. Help us in 2023. We could use your support. Our fundraising cycle is quite cyclical, and uh, we've kind of ran out of the funds from our fundraiser. But don't worry, we'll have a fundraiser in 2024, please, God. But if you want to help us get through this final patch, visit our website, torchweb.org. Make a donation. You can find the link in the description. And of course, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. We have arrived at the 13th and final principle of Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith. We started this project in January of 2019. And if you do the math, it's been 68 episodes covering the first 12 principles. And now we're up to principle number 13, which is the resurrection of the dead. And a quick refresher. Rambam is a very significant personality in Jewish history. He lived in the 12th century. He's one of the monumental figures of our people's glorious history. He wrote some of the most influential and consequential books and writings in our history. They're all absolute masterpieces. The one that we're following in this series is in his commentary to Mishnah. So, of course, Rabbi Judah the Prince, in the end of the second century, he compiles the laws of the oral Torah into the 63 books of Mishnah, divided up into six orders, six sessions. And in one of the Mishnahs, it talks about Olam Abba, the world to come, which is the ultimate destiny that we are all striving to obtain. And Rambam, in his commentary, he wrote a commentary on all 63 books, In his commentary, he starts off with a very long introduction, which is sort of a treatise on Olam Abba, but really reward and punishment in general. And then he proceeds to delineate 13 principles, foundations as he calls it, of our religion. What are the things that we actually believe? And what are central that create the the framework, the format in which everything else can exist? Now when Rambam did that, it was obviously hotly contested because he's differentiating between certain ideals, certain tenets, certain principles, and others. There are a lot of principles. There are a lot of mitzvos. There are a lot of details in our religion. It's comprehensive, completely, exhaustively comprehensive. Ramam separates 13 ideas and says these are the principles, and without this, you don't have a religion. When someone makes a claim like that, it's obviously going to arouse some pushback, which it did. And it was hotly contested and debated in its time. But ultimately, Rambam prevailed and it became universally accepted by all of Israel as the framework of our religion. In fact, in multiple places, it is incorporated into our prayer, into our liturgy. So these beliefs, they have been accepted. These are the central beliefs of our people. As we mentioned in the past, it's broken down into three main categories. The first five address the notion of God. Of course, you cannot have our religion if you question the idea of God, obviously. But what does that mean? He breaks it down to five different elements. Section number two is Torah. So Torah, of course, presupposes prophecy and the prophecy of Moshe and the idea of a divine Torah. And the idea of a divine Torah that doesn't change, those are the four elements that he 
tells us our central central beliefs in the in the middle section, namely that of Torah, and finally reward and punishment, which we of course talked about. Olam Abba, uh, the Almighty's uh, omniscience, his his total knowledge, of course Messiah, which we just finished, which is uh, principle number twelve, and finally the final element of reward and punishment, and the capstone, the conclusion of the thirteen principles, and that is Trias Amesim, resurrection of the dead. The dead, of which there are many, of course, they will come back alive. That is this principle. And our objective in our study of this principle, as it has been hitherto, it's to study the principle as comprehensively and completely as possible. And we're going to try to hopefully gain, please God, a fundamental understanding of it and maybe all of its dimensions to the best of our abilities. And it's not getting easier. Maybe the 13th may be the hardest one of all 13 to really understand. It is not clearly explicated. Maybe that's by design, but it's not clearly explicated in the sources. There's a lot of work that we need to do to be able to unpack this principle and all of its elements. But of course, we don't shy away from a challenge. So let's begin. We're going to begin with actually citing the words of the Rambam, what he says about it, and then we'll try to get more of an introduction to the subject, which we will cover, of course, in subsequent uh, get-togethers. He begins by telling us that this principle is a foundation of the foundations of Moshe, our teacher. And there is no religion. And there is no connection or association with the religion of Judaism to someone who does not believe in it. So he gives us a very uh, strongly worded statement about resurrection, that it's a critical, foundational, indispensable element of our religion. And then he tells us, resurrection is only for the righteous gives us this this component, that when we're talking about resurrection as a principle of faith, it's only for the righteous. And he cites a midrash to this effect. The midrash says that when we have bountiful rain, everyone benefits. If it's a good rainy season, it makes the lands really fertile. You have two neighboring farmers, one's righteous, one's wicked, they both equally benefit. However, resurrection, it's only for the righteous. So it's interesting, the Ramam is highlighting the fact that resurrection in this context is only for the righteous. And then he adds, the Talmud tells us that the righteous, when they are dead, they're actually alive. And the wicked, when they're alive, they're actually dead. The Torah is a very different definition of life and death. By our standards, if someone has brain activity, if someone has a pulse, if someone has consciousness, if someone's able to talk or to walk, we would define them as alive. If someone is a cadaver, they're a corpse, and they're not conscious in a way that we can perceive. They're not able to talk or to engage. They don't eat. They start to decompose. We define that person as dead. The Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos on page 18, B, on the top, that the Torah is a different definition. The wicked, they're dead even when they're alive. Because the Torah doesn't look at the body per se, it looks at the soul. And if someone doesn't treat the soul well, doesn't feed the soul well, doesn't provide the soul's agenda, they may be alive by our standards, but in the eyes of the Torah, they're, they're dead. Whereas, the wicked, I'm sorry, whereas the righteous, they, by definition, they're ones who are feeding their soul. And therefore, their body may have ceased to function, but their soul, why can't it exist post-mortem? So they're alive, even when they're dead. Says the Rambam, how can we say that resurrection happens to the wicked even when they're alive, they're dead? Certainly once they're dead... They're going to remain so. The Ram is 
insistent that resurrection in this context is only for the righteous, which is an important note to keep in the back of our mind. We're, we're just going to do an introduction today, but we'll hopefully pursue this further. What he's telling us is that when we're addressing resurrection, we're talking about the kind of life that the righteous have and the wicked don't have. And then he tells us that people need to die. They need to break down. They need to return to what they're composed of. Humans are hybrids. Half body, half soul. Half dust of the earth, half blowing life into their nostrils. And by definition, they need to die. It's not clear what he means. The commentaries, when they address this point in Rambam, they seem to say that even after resurrection, the righteous come back alive, they'll still die. Because the points that they are comprised of have to separate. Things that are amalgamations have to come apart. Things that are comprised of various components must be broken down to their component parts, which is a subject of great debate. Now, because this is the 13th and final principle, Rambam offers a conclusion. And he talks about the importance of these 13 principles, and he uses very harsh, very strong words. And he tells us that when a person believes all of these principles, and it becomes clear to them, and they have real faith in them, then they can be part of Israel. And someone like that, they're not just biologically Jewish, culturally Jewish, in their pedigree they're Jewish, their beliefs, their ideology is also Jewish. And it's so important to love that person and to be merciful upon that person. This is what renders someone into an ideological Jew, not just birthright, these 13 principles. And if such a person who believes these 13 principles, but they sin, they may have followed the ways of the Yitzhahara, nature may have overwhelmed them. Yes, they will be punished for their sins. But nonetheless, they merit a portion in Olam Abba. Eternally, they have life. Of course, the sin must be addressed. No sin goes unpunished. If you don't repent, you will have to address for it. 100%. But Olam Abba will remain their destiny. He calls them the wicked of Israel, but they're still part of Israel. However, if a person rejects, repudiates any one of these 13 principles, they have excluded themselves ideologically from the nation of Israel. They have rejected, they are heretics on central beliefs, and they're called a min, or not, of course, these are names for various names of, of heretics, apostates. Kotzeitz binatios, which is a code word for someone, what it actually means is someone who cuts saplings, which means that they're severing themselves from their source. And someone like that, the Rambam concludes, it's a mitzvah to hate them. These are the people that hate Hashem. And the Rambam says again, very harsh language, that someone who hates Hashem, it's a mitzvah for us to hate them. And then Rambam reinforces the imperative to study the the 13 principles with intense concentration and, and repetition. And he says... I have spoken at length in these matters and I have departed from the style of my book, the Rama Minas Commentary to Mishnah, which again, that's where you find these explications of the 13 principles. It's very different than the tone and the style of the rest of the book. And he says, I, I've departed. I've departed from the, the typical style and I only did it because I saw it was very valuable, it was very beneficial. And he tells us what he did. He says, I gathered from all the disparate sources, I gathered the true beliefs of our religion. I did a lot of work because these weren't all 
bundled together beforehand. They're, they're scattered. I worked to gather them into one coherent, cogent code of principles. And therefore, the Rambam speaks to the reader. You should know them, and you should repeat them, and you should review them, and you should study them intensely, many times. And you should dwell upon them and ruminate and cogitate upon them very well. And if your heart convinces you to believe that, well, I read it once or even ten times, I've discharged my responsibility. Behold, again, the Ram is using very unusual language for himself. Behold, Hashem knows that your heart has led you astray based upon a falsehood. And therefore, don't hurry up. Don't expedite the reading of these principles because I didn't just concoct beliefs based upon what I encountered. This is not just a hodgepodge of beliefs. Oh, I have a, this is a nice thing. Why don't we include that? This is something. Isn't that beautiful? Let's put that in. This was not assembled arbitrarily. I put it in after intense focus and intense introspection and study. And because I saw clear, true, lucid beliefs, and I saw other ones that were fake, that were false, that were crooked and corrupt. I saw what you should believe in and what you should not believe in it. And I brought proofs to substantiate it. That's why I put these together. And he ends off with a prayer. The Almighty should help me to actualize my desire and to guide me in, in the good path. And then he says, he concludes his treatment of the 13 principles. Let me return to the matters of the Mishnah that I am commentating upon. So the Ramam does end his explication of 30 principles by telling us of the importance of it and how he went about to assemble it and the importance of studying it not just on a cursory surface level, on a superficial level, but to go deep. And I, I think that in our series, in our studies of these principles, we've really uh, uh, strived to do that, to really study it in a very deep and comprehensive way. So let's talk about the 13th and final principle, resurrection of the dead. The dead, they stopped working. They died. Cessation of brain activity. Flatlined. They're buried. They will come back to life. What does this mean? What must we know about this? As we tried to do with the previous principles, we hope to cover this subject to its length and breadth, examine everything that we know about it, everything that we can perhaps speculate about it, to try to see all the dimensions of it, and there are a lot of dimensions. We have a lot of questions. What is resurrection? What does it mean? How does it work? How does resurrection happen? Why must we have resurrection? Why is there a need to fuse body and soul? Isn't the body a fungible, disposable commodity? What's wrong with the soul existing as a soul in the realm of souls? Isn't the soul all that really matters? Why is there a need to get the band back together to put the soul and body once again together? Very basic questions. When is resurrection going to happen? Or did it happen? What's the timeline of resurrection? Ramam was very clear that resurrection happens to the righteous What about the fate of the wicked? What happens with them? Are there different types of resurrection? Is it all the same? Is all resurrection uniform? Why, in fact, is resurrection only for the righteous? What happens afterwards? Okay, you've been brought to life. Congratulations. 
What now? What's the purpose? What are you supposed to do now that you have been resurrect- r- resurrected? The basic questions of, of how, of what, of, of who, of when, of why, they're, they're not clear at all from what we've seen. It's a massive subject. And I think it's, it's even more unclear than Messiah, which was, again, a very broad, sprawling subject. And we're going to try to approach it from the outside and hopefully edge our way closer and closer to the heart of the matter. So let's begin with some citations of our sages. The Mishnah that Rambam bases his whole treatise on reward and punishment and the 13 principles of faith upon, it starts off with the iconic words, call Yisrael, all of Israel, yesh lahem chelek l'olam haba. They have a portion in olam haba. The world to come, the ultimate world, all of Israel have a portion in it with the exception of certain people. And these are the ones that lose their portion in Olam And the first person who is cited, Ha'omer, Ein Tchias Amesim Min HaTorah. The person who says, there is no resurrection of the dead from the Torah. There's no citation in the Torah that proves the notion of resurrection. If someone says, well, resurrection is not a Jewish idea, it's not a Torah idea, they are the first category of Jews that are expelled from the cohort of people that have Olam Abba. Now, it's interesting that the Mishnah specifically says that the person who loses Olam Abba is one who questions the legitimacy of resurrection. It doesn't just say someone who questions resurrection. It says specifically someone who questions the biblical sources, the scriptural sources of resurrection. There's a very beautiful comment in Rashi where Rashi says, even if someone believes in resurrection but doesn't know that it's sourced in the Torah, in the words of Rashi, what do we care about his belief? How does he know? Where is it substantiated? If it's just a belief that's not grounded in something real, if it's just some nice idea that a person has, that would not suffice. You have to really understand it. You have to know that it's legitimate, legitimate, legitimized and substantiated in the Torah. So this is obviously very important. The very first person that is excluded from Olamaba is one who questions the legitimacy and the, the scriptural origin of resurrection. But what exactly is resurrection? The Ramam gives us very, very sparse details here. He does write more elsewhere. In fact, there is an entire work, a treatise of Rambam on Tchiesa Mason, on resurrection. Hopefully we'll get to that in due course. But just as an outsider, my initial analysis I think reveals maybe four different definitions to the idea of resurrection. Then again, we're at the very early stages of just trying to understand the concept. So I think on, on a most basic level, something that we're all very familiar with at night, we go to sleep. The Talmud tells us that sleep is an element of death. It's a sixtieth of death. It has some associations. There's some overlap between going to sleep, being comatose effectively in bed, and death. In some way, it's similar. Yes, there's still brain activity. Yes, there's still a pulse. There's still life. But there are some signs of death, meaning that someone's not aware of their surroundings. Someone doesn't see. Someone doesn't hear, per se. You really have to shake them awake if you want to get their attention. You have to snap them out of that. Their soul, we know, to a certain extent, leaves the body. And in fact, the Talmud says that waking up in the morning, 
is an element of resurrection. And that's why the Talmud instructs us that when a person wakes up, there's a prayer about the soul. And the prayer says, God, so it starts, the soul that you have placed within me is, is pure. You formed it. You installed it within me. You guard it within me. And you, in the future, will take it away from me and return it to me in the future. For all the time that the soul is within me, I thank you, Hashem, our God, the God of our forefathers, the master of all the worlds, the overseer of all the souls, and then we have the final blessing, Baruch Hashem, bless you, Hashem, who restores the souls to dead corpses. When you wake up, the Talmud tells us, it's a version of resurrection. Now, I don't think the Ramam is telling us what to believe in in waking up in the morning. We all believe that. That's not what he's saying, but I think it's a good way to get our brains more customized to the notion of resurrection, that it's like a parable almost, and it helps us bring the concept a little bit closer to our sensibilities, that this idea of resurrection is in some small way, it's like a parable, it's an analogy towards the resurrection that is being addressed over here. When someone's asleep, they're, you've heard this term, they're dead to the world. They're immobile. They're really unaware of their body or their surroundings. They don't see, they don't walk around. Some people do, I know. But they, most people don't walk around. They don't eat. The soul we know goes to other places. And then in the morning, there is a degree of resurrection. So again, this is not what Rambam is talking about. But the Talmud does connect this routine of, of going to sleep at night and having a degree of death and wake up in the morning and a degree of resurrection. It's, a th- it's an interesting way to help get our sensibilities a little bit closer to what's happening over here. In Genesis, Jacob talks about his death. And he uses the words, not I will die, I will be buried, I will expire. He says, I will go to sleep. And again, we see that Jacob, this is in Genesis chapter 47, verse 30, Jacob is using the words, I'm going to sleep, which we know implies perhaps waking up as well. He uses that term because the righteous will have resurrection. It might be a longer sleep. And maybe a lot of other things happen in the duration But fundamentally, there is an overlap between going to sleep and waking up and going to die and waking up with resurrection. So that's maybe one way to think about level one. A second way to think about it is the citations that we have, the stories that we have of resurrection. People who were dead there was a cessation of all signs of life and they came back. In chapter 17 of the book of Kings, Kings 1, Elijah revives the dead. And his student, Elisha, also revived the dead. This is in Kings 2, chapter 4. And then we have the memorable description of Ezekiel, Ichastel. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, with all the bones coming back to life. So, I don't know if this is exactly what Ramam is talking about, but we do see this notion, and we have documentation of this idea that someone can be dead and can have that reversed via some prophet, either uh, Elijah Elisha or Ezekiel, and there are other instances as well, that can happen where death can be undone. It can be, can be reversed. Now, there is an interesting question that the commentaries ask about this form of resurrection. The Talmud in the book of Titus, page 2a, tells us, 
that there are three keys that are exclusively in the hands of God. He doesn't outsource these keys to others. And they are the key of rain. God decides when it rains, how it rains, where it rains, etc. The key of life. And the key of resurrection. These are keys that can only be utilized and deployed by God. So wait a minute. How is Elijah using this key or Elisha or Ezekiel? So there are various answers. Some say that, well, permanently these keys are only in the hands of God, but temporarily a prophet who is obviously deserving of it can access said key. Alternatively, these were actually done by God, but the prayer only got God to do it. But this is, I think, another way of thinking about resurrection. This is more than just waking up in the morning. It's not really a, a total paradigm shift because someone is dead. We're familiar with that. Someone being alive, we're also familiar with that. We've seen people who are alive by our definition. And of course, the, the notion of people dying is also not distant from our understanding. It's not clear if this is really what Ramam is talking about, that you know the, the resurrection, so to speak, effectuated by or through Elijah, Elisha, and Ezekiel. Is that exactly what he's mentioning or, or what, what he's invoking here in this principle? It's not so clear. But I think it's a level up from the notion of going to sleep and waking up in the morning. And then we get to the other two elements of resurrection. Resurrection that will occur during Messiah. We have many sources that talk about in the times of Messiah, we mentioned this very briefly in our discussion of Messiah. We have many sources that say that during the Messianic era, there will be those who died who come back alive. And again, we know that Messiah, that is a perfection of our world. Messiah is a time where this world becomes transformed and refined and perfected. So there's, there's still mitzvos and there's still humans with a body and a soul, but it's a more elevated kind of life. And we have a temple and we have a Davidic monarchy, etc. But it's not a total paradigm shift. It's this world and all the rules governing this world. Everything about this world is the same. It's just much better, much more elevated and transformed. That is perhaps what the Ramam is, is telling us. Maybe. That in the times of Messiah, there will be a resurrection of the righteous and just as Messiah in general is an opportunity for people to be elevated and transformed and perfected and refined, so too the people who come back alive will have that opportunity. They too will be availed. It will be availed to them the opportunity to earn the perfection that is accorded in the times of Messiah. And finally, the fourth and final dimension just again, as, as an outsider trying to get into the subject, the fourth and final dimension is the resurrection that is associated not with this world, but with Olam Abba. And that is something which is a total paradigm shift because everything that we know about this world does not apply in the world to come. There's, there's almost no overlap between our world and the next world. Even the great prophets were told they were not capable of understanding, of visualizing, of understanding in a fundamental way what it means, Olam Haba. And the sources are clear, just as we have sources that tell us that there's a resurrection in the times of Messiah, the sources are very clear that there is a resurrection that is linked to Olam Haba. And you don't have to go very far. Once you finish the Mishnah, about all of Israel has a world, portion of the world to come, besides for these people, lists all the people. The very first line in the Talmud, which is the, again, the commentary on the Mishnah, the Talmud asks, 
the following question. Why so harsh? Why does someone who rejects resurrection, why do they lose their portion? It seems a little bit draconian. Seems harsh. Seems very severe. And the answer will leave no doubt about the link between Oma and resurrection. Who kafar b'tchiasem The person who repudiates resurrection of the dead. Therefore, it's only fitting that he loses his resurrection of the dead. Again, if you read this Talmud, it's abundantly clear. The Talmud is 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 saying that resurrection of the dead is synonymous with Olam Abba. Because again, the Mishnah says, these are the people who lose Olam Abba. The first person who loses it is someone who rejects resurrection of the dead. Why, says the Talmud? Well, if you reject it, you don't have it. It's obvious. It seems fitting. Tit for tat. If you don't want this, you don't believe in this, okay, you don't have this. But the Talmud is, is using resurrection of the dead and Olam Abba interchangeably. Because the Mishnah is talking about why someone loses Olam Abba, and the Talmud says, well, you lose Olam Abba if you don't believe in resurrection because you lose resurrection. And there's no portal, there's no pathway to get to Olam Abba without resurrection of the dead. So evidently, we see that resurrection is not only about going to sleep, waking up, or Elisha bringing back someone to this world, or even times of Messiah, when this world is more perfected and elevated and, and refined, the righteous coming back to achieve their elevation that they need in the times of Messiah. There is an element of resurrection that is some sort of portal and, and pathway to Olam Abba. And if you don't have resurrection, definitionally, the Talmud tells us, you don't have Olam Haba. Now, which one of these four is Rambam addressing? Rambam is completely moot at this point. We have no idea. Or, uh, again, maybe we do have an idea, but at least upon initial study of his words, we don't really see it. Now, Again, we're just trying to kind of survey the landscape here before we go deep into any of these subjects. The Mishnah tells us that you have to believe in resurrection to be a member of Olam Abba. But it's not enough to believe in resurrection. You have to also believe that the source of resurrection is in the Torah. So Tom says, okay, well, where's the source? Citation needed. Where does it say in the Torah that the dead will come back alive? So the Talmud begins to cite numerous sources that prove this point. And the first proof is about tithes. We know that there are all sorts of tithes that you must do to be compliant with the laws of tithes in the Torah. You gotta give 10% to the Levite, you gotta give 2% to the Kohen, uh, the tenth animal is, is, is the tithing of the animals, uh, the first three years of a fruit tree, there's many laws. And then there's year seven, where's the cessation of work, the Shemitah, year 50, the Oval. There is a tithe called Trumas Meiser. It's like a tithe for a tithe. I give 10% of my field, of my yield to the Levite. The Levi, in turn, has to pay his taxes, so to speak. He's got to give 10% of that to the Kohen. And this is featured in the book of Numbers, chapter 18. And the verse is like this. The Levite takes 10% and gives it to Aaron, the Kohen. Wait a minute. Aaron died before the conquest of Canaan and before any of the laws of tithing were implemented. He never entered the land. He was buried on on Mount Hor, outside the land. Aaron was never a recipient of this tithe, the tithe from the tithe that the Levite gives to the Kohen. Yet it says, the Levite gives it, doesn't say to the Kohen, generically, to Aaron the Kohen. Concludes the Talmud, it must be that Aaron at one point will be a recipient. 
this tithe from a tithe. You give 10% to the Levite, and the Levite gives 10% to Aaron the high priest. Aaron's dead. And he died before these laws were ever implemented. It must be that the Torah is telling us that Aaron will once again rise from the dead and receive the tithe from the tithe. We have a conclusive proof in the Torah from the book of Numbers chapter 18, verse 28 to the concept of the resurrection of the dead. Now, this is a very interesting proof, obviously. The Talmud doesn't cite any way to rebut it. But there's an amazing comment in Rashi, which throws a little bit of a wrench, but there's a lot of wrenches already in uh, in the subject. When the Talmud says that Aaron will come back alive, Rashi says he'll come back alive, le olam haba, for olam haba. And this is a bit surprising because we know, and we've seen this in the past, and the Talmud says this repeatedly, that the world of Olam Abba is different than the world that we have today. And it tells us that there's no eating and there's no drinking in Olam Abba. I would imagine there's no agriculture in Olam Abba either. Yet the Talmud says that Amr will rise, resurrection, okay, and he'll be a recipient of an agricultural tithe. Evidently, the world that he's coming back to, it's a world where agriculture still exists. Yet Rashi says in his comment, Aaron will rise le olam haba for the purpose of olam haba. It's a little bit of a problematic Rashi, but any problem is another insight that we can perhaps pursue. Regardless, this is yet another source that makes it clear, this Rashi comment is another source that makes it clear that resurrection is intimately linked with Olam Abba. A second proof. This is all from the book of Sanhedrin on page 90b. What's the source for resurrection in the Torah? So we have one from Aaron. We have a second one from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the beginning of the book of Exodus, Parshas Va'era, Hashem tells Moshe, I will uphold my covenant that I made with the forefathers. This is when Moshe didn't want to go back because, you know, he started to try to save the Jewish people, but their conditions worsened. And God differentiates the relationship that he had with the forefathers and the relationship that he's having now with Moshe. And then God says, this is Exodus chapter 6, verse 4, I will uphold my covenant with them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them the land of Canaan. It doesn't say to give to you, to the nation, the land of Canaan. To give them. Well, they died in the past, and they died before the nation that they spawned acquired the land, conquered the land, settled the land. They must be the coming back. And they're coming back, and then the, the, this, this will be fulfilled. The covenant where God promised to give them the land, it will be fulfilled after, after the resurrection. So we, here we see a citation that the forefathers, they will live in the land of Israel, which again implies a terra firma based living, and that's a proof for the resurrection. A third proof. The verse in Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is part of the Shema, the second paragraph of the Shema, where again the verse says that God promised your four forefathers to give them the land of Israel. Not to give you, to give them. Must be the coming back. Seems pretty airtight and convincing. A fourth proof. This is also from the book of Devarim, chapter 4, verse 4. You are cleaving to Hashem your God. Chaim kulchem hayom. Life, all of you today. Life, all of you today. That's what it says. Everyone's alive today. The word today, the Talmud understands, is superfluous. Obviously, it's talking to everyone today. So what does it mean? Why would you have to add the extra word? It must be that this verse is telling us 
that the life that you have today, you will have in the future as well. And you'll be alive in the future as you are today. Now, I'm just giving you some example, a little bit of a flavor of how the Talmud proceeds to unpack this subject. It cites numerous such proofs, more than a dozen, to substantiate the notion of the resurrection of the dead from the Torah. There are many, many sources, as we've seen. It's not clear why this is all needed. You know, the, the, the Mishnah says, you have to believe in resurrection of the dead, and then it comes from the Torah. Okay, so one, one proof would suffice, you would imagine. Why does the Talmud labor to find so many inferences in the Torah to the principle of the resurrection? Perhaps, again, this is just me speculating as a total outsider to the subject. Perhaps these are not necessarily proofs to the same idea. Maybe each proof is a different element, a different dimension of resurrection. And again, where we're total outsiders, it's a murky and opaque subject. But from the fact that the Talmud really belabors this idea of, of trying to find sources of the Torah for the resurrection, maybe there's there's more nuance than what appears to be on the on the surface. But we're just trying to get uh, comfortable with this whole idea of of the dead coming back alive. And I want to cite uh, some sources, some some pieces in the Talmud about a resurrection, which I think will help bring the concept a bit closer to us. There's a very interesting motif that repeats itself in the Talmudic literature about the resurrection. The Talmud records many conversations between great rabbis and Roman nobility about the subject of resurrection. Now, this, this is an interesting idea, the idea of the dead come back alive. It fascinates us. Apparently, it fascinated the Romans as well. And the Roman aristocracy would call over the great rabbis and say, okay, well, help, help me understand this part, help me understand that part of, of resurrection. And the Talmud cites a bunch of examples of conversations. It documents conversations between the, the Roman leaders and high society and the greatest rabbis of the era. Here are some citations. This is again from Sanhedrin 90b. Cleopatra the Queen. She asked Rabbi Mayer. Rabbi Meir is a very important personality in the Mishnaic literature because he's the primary author of the Mishnah. When Rabbi Judah the Prince assembled the Mishnah, he started off just the, the base upon which he started were the notes and the writings of Rabbi Meir. So this is the most reputable, authoritative source that we can come up with. And we have a conversation cited in the Talmud between Cleopatra the Queen and Rabbi Meir. And it went like this. She said, I know that the dead will come back alive. I don't question that. That she accepts. But when they come back alive, will they be clothed or will they be naked? That was her question. Is it a silly question? It sounds kind of silly. That's what she said. And he responded, I will prove to you from a wheat kernel. When you bury, remember that word, you bury a wheat kernel. No, no, we, we have a difference. We have a difference between burying and planting. The Talmud often, and we'll see this is another repeating theme in the literature about resurrection. The Talmud uses the term burying and planting interchangeably in this context. Because it's the same thing. You, you bury wheat, not because you don't want to see it ever again, because you actually do want to see it in a much more beautiful way. You want it to service, you know, you, you want one kernel to, to sprout a whole bushel, right? That's what you want. And it describes it as, as burying. Planting is burying. And, and burying is planting. Hold that thought. Says the great rabbi, the the wheat is buried naked. 
And when it emerges, it has many, many layers. That's the chaff. Well, the righteous, they're buried, clothed, which seems to be implying the burial shrouds that we bury the dead with. So if the if something which is buried naked comes out clothed, certainly something which is buried clothed comes out clothed. That was his response to Cleopatra as cited in the Talmud. Now it is important to note, just as the Ramam told us again and again, resurrection is only for the righteous. He does say, Tzadik, the righteous who are buried clothed, When they emerge, they will certainly emerge clothed. Again, he seems to limit at least this form of resurrection to the righteous exclusively. And we have a parable. The the death and burial equals planting. Just as the planting of the wheat, you can expect it to emerge in a different dimension, a different way, in a more expanded way, in a more clothed fashion. So too, the burial, that too is a form of planting. Now, what does it mean to emerge clothed? And what exactly is this analogy? You know, if, you t- if you were to take a seed and put it in the ground, something which is very similar to the seed emerges, but also very different. We think of the dead coming back alive as bringing the band back together. What we're told over here is that the relationship between the righteous before their burial slash planting and the righteous after their emergence from the ground, it's similar to what changes to to the wheat when you put one kernel and all bushel comes out. It's, it's the same thing, but in a much more realized, actualized, developed way. Again, these are all ideas that we'll hopefully revisit. We have the next citation, the very next part of the Talmud. Caesar, Caesar, the Caesar, says to Rabban Gamliel, again, he was the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, the president of the Jewish people. And we have an amazing documentation of a conversation that they had. Unlike Cleopatra, who accepted the notion of resurrection, he says, I don't know, you guys say that resurrection happens. Amrisu, you say that the dead will come back alive. But how can that be? The dead, they're dust. Could dust live? That's a pretty sharp question. You put a body into the ground, it starts to decompose. You dig it up and you don't find the body. The body's gone. Well, what do you have? You have dust. What happened to the body? The body became one with the dust. Dust is not alive. It's inanimate. So how can dust come back alive? That was the Caesar's question. And the great rabbi doesn't even respond. The Talmud tells us that there was a third person privy to this conversation, the Caesar's daughter. And she says to the great rabbi, I will respond. I got this. And this is her answer. Suppose you have two contractors in a city. Two people building things in the city. One builds edifices out of water. One builds edifices out of mortar. Which one's more impressive? So the Caesar responds, well, anyone could build, well, not anyone, most people People who are gifted in construction, they could build a building out of, out, of, out of bricks, out of mortar, out of cement. But to build something out of water, that's way more impressive. So it's established. Building out of water is much harder than building out of mortar. Says the daughter of Caesar to Caesar, God today creates humans out of water. The building blocks of a human is is fluid. That happens. If God could create humans out of water, of course he could create them out of dust. Today, 
all the living humans are created, to go back to the actual origin, out of fluid, out of water. And we're not very impressed by that because we are so accustomed to it. But you already told me, uh, Sir Caesar, that water-based construction is much more impressive than mortar-based construction. And this is if you think about resurrection. And it makes a lot more sense. It seems to us to be fantastic because it's just not what we're used to. But is it really so hard to create humans out of dust? It's much easier than to create them the way that you're doing it today. It's much easier if we were being honest. Thus concludes the opinion of the daughter of Caesar, cited in the Talmud. Now there's a very deep subtlety being conveyed here. Humans today are formed one way, in a water-based construction. In the future, they will be made in a different way, in a dust-based construction. I mentioned this in my book, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp, which I have several chapters in part five of the book on resurrection. I pointed out something very interesting about this conversation. We know of exactly one person that was created out of dust. Of course, that's Adam. All subsequent humans were created out of water, out of the fluids. But he was created out of the dust of the earth. The Talmud is implying that the kinds of humans that will be featured in the world of the resurrection will not be like us. They will be more like Adam. Now, Adam is completely different than the way we are. The Midrash tells us that when Adam was created, initially out of dust, the angels were so taken by him, they mistook him for God, and they wanted to bow down to him. The distance, so to speak, between between the human and God was much less than it is today. Angels do not conflate us with God. I guarantee you that. (laughs) They do not. But Adam, created from the dust, was a completely different paradigm. And the Talmud is implying from this analogy, cited initially by the daughter of Caesar, that the resurrection is the recreation of humanity in the paradigm of Adam. Not simply to come back in the way we are today, the The seed looks very different than the final product. What comes back out is very different than the water-based construction of that same person in the previous paradigm. Again, very, very interesting. Now, there are other sources about conversations between the Romans and the great rabbis. Talmud actually offers a second alternative interpretation as to what the daughter of Caesar said to her father. We have a very interesting conversation between Rabbi Judah the Prince, the architect of the Mishnah, and the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, also about resurrection. Again, we see that the Romans were really fascinated by this. And that will reveal another dimension of the Resurrection, namely that of judgment, which is central to this subject. Judgment, ultimate judgment, has to happen in the same modality as the sins and the mitzvos that were done. You want to reward and punish the same entity that did the mitzvah or the crime. If you have twins and one of them commits a crime, you can't punish the other one just because they look the same, right? It's not fair. The body and soul do the mitzvahs. The body and soul do the sins. The body and soul must be there for the reward and the punishment. And we'll see more about that and the very fascinating conversation between Robert Drew the Prince and Antoninus that really bears that out. But we're just getting warmed up here. There are many dimensions of this subject that we hope we've got to dive into deeply. There are all sorts of very intricate debates in the medieval literature, some of the contentious points about 
this idea, maybe the most central debate, is what is the state of the human in the world to come and the world of resurrection? Is there a body? Yes or no? What's the nature of said body if there is a body? We'll try to get into that as well. The whole idea of the seventh millennium, which is just like we have you know, the six days of creation and, and Shabbos. We have the 6,000 years that we've mentioned in the past. And then the seventh millennium, what happens during that great thousand year period? It's a mystery to us. What happens subsequently in the eighth or maybe the ninth millennium? A total mystery. The idea of Yovel factors into this discussion as well. Because Yovel is the notion of six years, then the seventh, and then another six years in the seventh, and then another six years in the seventh, and seven cycles of seven. And finally, it spins out of the seven cycle format and it goes into year 50, which is not year one of a cycle, but it's, a, it's something else. It's an entirely different dimension. That is very much associated with the notion of resurrection of the dead and Omaba, as we shall hopefully see. There is in the literature this Great, awesome day of judgment. This idea of final reconciliation of everything. A lot of subjects lay before us. There's a lot to talk about, and we're just getting started. We are at the point of the 13th principle, 13th one, resurrection of the dead. I'm excited to hopefully go through these subjects with y'all in the ensuing weeks and months. Again, I... I'm at the beginning stages. There's a lot to read, a lot to study, a lot to analyze, a lot to ponder. But hopefully with the help of the Almighty, we will be able to go through this principle and gain a deep fundamental understanding on its various elements and dimensions to the best of our abilities. Again, we'll probably reach points where we'll have to cry uncle and throw up our hands and say, well, this is something which is beyond us. That's okay as long as we understand what is beyond us. What do we know about what we don't know? That is a very good place to arrive at. Hopefully lay it out and organize it in a systematic way as we've strove to do hitherto. I'm looking forward to doing this. It's to be re- really exciting. And of course, my email address is rabbywall.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. This was a delight. It's a challenge. And I'm looking forward to digging into it with y'all, uh, uh, please God, in the upcoming uh, episodes in the weeks and months to come.